tried but he lost you cannot be stopped when we cried
seated as we move into our time of communion. battle is won. We are overcomers. I'd like to share something with you that I thought of this week and we came to this time. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a courtroom, but whether you have been physically there or not, you are. Standing in the courtroom, and I heard, how do you plead? The accuser of the brethren was staring at me. He said, we've got your number. There is no escape. Here are your messes, your failures and mistakes. He pointed to the corner where the scales of justice stood. I saw so many failures there, there was nothing good. In that very moment when it seemed all hope was lost, I said, I plead the blood of Jesus and his death upon the cross. One drop of blood fell to the scales. It covered all my messes, all my transgressions. And every time I failed, the enemy, our enemy, is mighty comes in like a flood, but he was defeated by one drop of blood. And in Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11a, the scripture reads this way, then I heard a vo loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And that's why we celebrate communion as we do, and that's why it's so important. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for overseeing through the centuries the day that we would be born and the purpose you've given to us for life. You said in your word that I know the plans I have for you. And Father, we choose this day to walk in your word. We choose to grow closer to you. And we remember that we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and what you did for us. Thank you. And may you be blessed and glorified and honored through all that we think, do, and say in this service and in this coming day and week, the time that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go ahead and move into our time of offering as we finish wrapping up communion and, and take this, this time. We stand on this foundation, hope as an anchor, faith is our flag, the cross is our courage, your word as a way. Through wars and rumors, 
wars of wars, still you are sovereign, still you are the Lord above the confusion. Your covenant stands, for you have not, not for a moment, abandoned your promise to save. Draw your hand. Our God is ever almighty, is ever almighty to save. Yes, our God is ever almighty, is ever almighty always. Here and now, stone upon stone you are building a people your own your kingdom unshaken your church is alive here is one with hearts all aflame and all our devotion to your great name exalted forever Jesus, you reign. We will not, not for a moment, forget your promise to save. And we will not, not for a 
For a lot of you, uh, we think about that we got one shot at this. You ever stop and think about that? Maybe the older you get, you start to think about it more. We got one shot at this. And what is it all about? We've been using the illustration, and you guys and gals are familiar with it, here on the wall, over by the front window. You might be able to see it. There's a thumb push pin there. It's a red one. It represents our life here and now versus the room, which is our life eternal. Of course, when we think of it in that perspective, why is my concern so much focused on here and now versus what God has eternal for us? So let's pray, and we'll get into study this morning on that. Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you so much for your love, your grace, and your mercy that you've shown us for the truth of your word and for a clear understanding. We just pray for that here and now. Lord, I do pray that we would have hearts and minds and wills that are willing to say yes to whatever it is that you lead and guide us in. Uh, we want to be your servants. We want to be your children. We know that we have that through you, Jesus Christ, and the price that you paid on the cross for us. So with that understanding, we come to worship now in the truth of your word. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, with this whole idea of the afterlife, heaven and hell, all these different things that we hear in the world, what we want to do in this study is look at what the Bible teaches. And I think those things are pretty clear. One of the things we're going to look at today is that Jesus talks about hell. Remember last week what we said about Jesus in speaking of hell? He speaks of it very matter-of-factly as a place. Uh, he doesn't talk about it an awful lot. Who in this room knows how many times uh, that God or Jesus talks about hell versus heaven? In the Bible, he talks about heaven three times more than he talks about hell. And so I ask myself the question, why? You know, if heaven and hell and they're this literal place and this is where we go, why isn't there more talk of it? You know, why doesn't Jesus just, you know, say, hey, up in heaven... I mean, there's literally this place you can go that is so wonderful, it will absolutely blow your mind. You know, I think of people that take vacation trips and stuff. I, I got the chance one time to go on the Mediterranean Sea and go around to Italy and places like that. Man, I love talking about it. I love to share what I saw and all that sort of thing. Why does Jesus not do that more? Why? Well, let me ask you this question. How many of you in this room ever watch Hallmark movies? Any of you? watch a Hallmark movie? Uh, guys, you can admit it too, all right? Yeah, Christmas time, okay? There is a theme that is used in those, and you all probably can name all kinds of themes that they use, but there's one that is a popular um, storyline, and it has to do with someone of royalty, and what is the theme from there? Take it away. What, what happens next? Someone of royalty what happens? Falls in love with a peasant. And does he share with that peasant his position or who he is or who she is? No. They fall in love just because of who they are, right? No sense of royalty or riches or any of that. You know, that's one of those things. And it, it, I can think of a half a dozen sermons or uh, movies right now in my mind where that's played out. Think about that with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You find that connection? What are we doing in church today? Well, we're here because of the Savior, our love for Him and the love that He has for us. We're not here because He promises there's going to be a mansion. At least that shouldn't be our motive. Our motive should be the love that we have for each other, and we get to be a part of that. You know, I, I mention all the time, uh, for myself, there was a place or a time in my life that it changed where going to church became a privilege and not just a duty of something I had to do on Sundays. It became a moment in my life where I wanted to be at church more than anything else because I realized I get to be with Jesus and worship with other people that are worshiping Jesus Christ. That mental change. Now, why is that important? Well, a lot of what we're talking about here in the afterlife, heaven and hell, deals with that motive, that drive, that innermost being. You notice how that pops up in the scripture so often, talking about that innermost being? What is that innermost being? 
What is it that makes you different from anyone else in this room? I'm not talking about the body or the package that you're in. I'm talking about who you are, your soul, your being. In our innermost being, are you in love with Jesus Christ today? When you were singing those songs and hearing those words, does it resound in you? Or has there, is there a point where you need to make that change and realize, I get to be in church today, not I have to be in church today. Now, as we look at some of these things today, first off, I want to point out this Pew Research uh, writer, uh, Carl Murphy, stated, it's natural for people to want things to turn out well in the end. Don't you all want that? We, we pray for our kids and stuff. We want them to, it all to turn out well in the end both in life and apparently afterwards. Now, this study was done back in 2015. It said roughly 7 in 10, 72% of Americans say they believe in heaven, defined as a place where people who have led good lives are eternally rewarded according to Pew Research. All right? So again, you know, we look at that picture that 72% of people back in 2015 were saying from this poll that they believe there is a heaven. Uh, They want that. They want something good. They want to believe in something good. Now, as it goes on, the center from the 2014 Religious Landscape Study said, but at the same time, 58% of U.S. adults also believe in hell. What's the difference in those numbers? 72% versus 58%. Who who can do the quick math? 14% difference here. Same people being surveyed. So out of the 72%, 14% less believed in a hell. They believe in heaven, but not necessarily hell. The point of what we're studying today is the factual placement of a hell and a heaven according to God's word. Uh, This went on to say that hell was a place where people who have led bad lives and died without being sorry are eternally uh, punished. Now, by the numbers... Here is in the Bible, how many times is a word hell, or that word in the Greek Hebrew used, hell, used in the Bible? Got any guesses? 162. You're real close for the next one. But for the first one, it's 14 times. Now, isn't that strange? That the actual word hell is used 14 times. Now, the word Hades is used five times. So 19 times in total for those two. Now, there's some other variations of those words that are used to describe that same place, but it's a fairly rare amount of times, wouldn't you say? The Bible's a big book. Now, heaven. Charlie. (laughs) Right closer to that. 422 times we find the word heaven. Now, understanding of that heaven is oftentimes referred to the heavens you know being the skies or the clouds and things of that nature but heaven being god's kingdom uh the kingdom of heaven we're going to look at today here in these words verses of the bible and then the word paradise is probably the biggest next one to that and paradise is found in the bible three times now i had mentioned earlier we're going to look at the words of jesus christ Do you know that Jesus only speaks about heaven three more times over what he speaks about hell? And again, it's always usually pretty matter of fact. There's not huge descriptions as to those locations or those places. It's just a matter of statement that they're there and that is the eternal resting place of all people. One one of those locations. So uh, I want you guys to understand that. John 11, verse 17 through 27 we're going to jump into this. So if you have your Bible or you have your phone with the Bible, John 11 records a story of a man named Lazarus. Are you familiar with that story? Lazarus was the son of Mary, Martha, or not son, brother, I'm sorry. And it passes away and literally talks about how Jesus raised him back to life. Now, if there's anyone who should be an expert on what takes place after you die, wouldn't it be someone that has been brought back to life and that has been there? Who in the room knows how much Lazarus is recorded in the Bible talking about what happened after he died? 
I think I heard it. Zero recording. Matter of fact, there's only really one recording of him after that, and it's just that it was mentioned he's reclining at the table eating with everyone else. So the dead guy brought back to lie, probably one of the most famous guys in the whole region, is, all it says is that he was eating supper with everyone else. And that's all we have. Why is that? I think the focus, and I'm, I think you're probably catching on to it, the focus is not the reward. The focus is the relationship. And we talk about it in this room all the time. We're not here to practice religion. We're here to practice a relationship with the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, leading into this, uh, they had come to Jesus and said, hey, Lazarus is really sick. Matter of fact, they laid it on him that if you don't come, he's probably going to die. Do you know how quickly Jesus came? Uh, he dropped everything and ran right there, right? Yeah, well, it says two, and then it probably was that third day before he arrived. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days, um, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary, Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, you know, what's getting ready to come next? Probably some of us in this room have said maybe the same kind of phrase. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So what was the statement from Martha? You know, why'd you let this happen? You could have done something about it. But even now, she says, you can do something. Anything you ask. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And what's the response of Martha to that? I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Isn't that what we Praise and worship God about that at the resurrection we will all be raised in that new life in Jesus Christ. That's what she's stating right here. Verse 25. Jesus said to her, what's the statement? I am the resurrection and the life. Real quick key to the passage. What is heaven all about? Why are we so desperate to get to heaven? Is it for the gold streets, the crystal sea, the mansions that are so wonderful? It's because who's there? Do you know there are spots in the Bible where it says, I'll be careful how I say that. Let me, let me put it this way. Man or woman, okay? But if you're living with a quarrelsome spouse, it says in the Bible, it is better to live on the corner of the roof than to live in the house with a quarrelsome spouse. Have you ever heard that or read that in the Bible? Some of you, amen, brother. Hallelujah. Yeah, I've read that. I know that one. What's the point? Listen, if you can live in a mansion and there's all kinds of nonsense going on there and people that don't like you and you don't get along, how wonderful is it to live in the mansion? But how many of you in this room could attest and think back to the most wonderful times of your life was living in some little poor little house with family and loved ones that all that mattered was to be together. You know, as we get older in life, a lot of you are probably already there. You start to think of Christmas and stuff. What matters to you at Christmas? Well, I can't wait to see what I get from everybody. Do you even think about that anymore? Or is it who can be there? Who can we gather into the room together? That's what matters most. What's it saying here? Jesus says, he is the resurrection and the life. Um, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? It's a big question for all of us in this room today. Do you all believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now there's some in between here where we read on down through that story of how Jesus is um, torn up about this whole situation. And I often wonder, what, you know, it's a, anybody memorize this passage? 
There's two words. You remember what the passage is? Shortest passage in the Bible. Yeah, Jesus wept. What was he crying about? Was he crying about Lazarus being dead? Or was he crying about the effects of sin? Was he crying about the way it was affecting all the people around him? Because he knew what was getting ready to happen. And yet he still wept because of the situation at hand. We jump on down. Uh, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, and I, th I think I probably would have been this person in the story, uh, Mar said Martha, the sister of the dead men, by this time, there's a bad odor. For he has been there for four days. Uh, what's Martha talking about? Is he talking about logistics? You know, the reality of the situation. His body is decaying. Ain't no way we want to open up that stone but because the Lord said so, they did. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Remember, he asked her, do you believe this? She said, yes. Do you really believe it? Here we go. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this, catch it, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Do you notice that throughout the scripture as you read? The stories and the situations that occur in scripture? Whose benefit is it all for? It's for the benefit of those reading to understand, to catch insight into it all. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. What was it that Jesus was displaying? Whose benefit was this for? Who did, what did Jesus say he was? He said he was what? The resurrection and the life. Where is eternal life, the afterlife, found it? It's found in Jesus Christ. This is my plea. Grab on to Jesus with everything you got. Be desperately in love with Jesus Christ. Heaven, I can't imagine what it's going to be like. The descriptions we're going to look more into next week about the beauty of it, the wonder of it, and all those sorts of things, but... The cause of it is Jesus Christ. And understanding this, as we gather in this house today, including myself, there's not a single one of us that is capable of going to heaven on our own. We talked about a courtroom case during the communion meditation. Can you imagine standing before God trying to justify your life without the benefits of Jesus Christ being there with you. I don't want to do that. Ain't, ain't a one of you here should either. Matthew 5, 1 through 16. Now, as we jump into Matthew 5, 1 through 16, what is this called? The Sermon where? Sermon on the Mount. Probably one of the most famous passages throughout. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is considered that Sermon on the Mount as he addressed the people. We find in the Sermon on the Mount, there's going to be a phrase there that says the kingdom of heaven is the only place in the Bible that is recorded, recorded almost 30 different times that we find that statement. All the other gospels say the kingdom of God and statements of that nature. Here in the gospel of Matthew, we have the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus, when, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. What is it to be poor in spirit? Basically, this is my own translation of it, not to be full of yourself, to be humble before God and who he is, being full of his spirit. Blessed uh, are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Is this just people that cry all the time? No, it's not necessarily what it's talking about. It's talking about what do you mourn? 
over. Seriously, what are you mourning about today? Are you mourning because somebody keyed your car this last week? Or are you mourning because of the sin and the effects of sin and what's happening to this world? Remember, I asked the question, why was Jesus crying? He knew the outcome, but yet he could see the effects of sin and what it does to his people. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. What is it to be meek? You know, one of our biggest problems that we have in Christendom right now is that people have a hard time admitting that they're wrong. They want to blame other people or, or explain their situation instead of simply saying, I'm wrong. You know, that picture of the courtroom. If we stand before God, are you ready to say, hey, Lord, I'm guilty? Because I can tell you this, that's the only answer. I'm guilty in desperate need of a Savior. That's it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Again, what is that? We hunger to do right. Not because it's the law, but because of the love relationship we have with Jesus. For they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is... The what? Again, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward where? In heaven. Again, back to our thumbtack on the wall. If that's a representation of our life here on earth, and this is all eternity, what's it all worth? How many of you feel like, feel like you got a bad lot in life? Anybody got a bad lot in life? You know, sometimes, whether we get bad lot or a good lot, whatever the case may be, we all get a life, right? And for some reason, at some point, I've been born at this time, this period of history, for the sake of the gospel. I don't know why. Why I was born to my mom and dad, or why I must steal, or any of those sorts of things. Why I'm at Southwest, however that may work. Why I get to take trips to Africa and things of that nature. But whatever the plan is, I get to be a part of it because I am who he has made me for this time, for this place, for this purpose. It leads into that next part. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. What are you all? You're salty, right? And you're supposed to be good salt. Not to be trampled upon, but to spice things up. That's what we've been made for. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father. Where? In heaven. All right, so we have this whole Beatitudes. It talks about who's blessed. It talks about the rewards of being blessed is Heaven, the kingdom of heaven, this picture of God's wonderful kingdom. And the whole purpose, the last part of what it says is, you're to be salt and you're to be light. What's the point? Again, what can we take to heaven with us? I remember hearing the story one time of a man who was buried and he requested to be buried in his antique Corvette. I don't know about you all, but I know my take on that. Uh, you're getting a wooden casket at the best, and I'm driving away in the car. I did a funeral one time for a Buddhist family. I did it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of them didn't know how to speak. They spoke Vietnamese, and every time I would end something, they would say amen because they had seen it on TV. So I was praising the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching the truth of the gospel for the funeral service, but then they were doing their Buddhist things on top of it. Like when they were getting ready to bury the person, they started to bring forward, and you can't burn money, and I know a lot of you have heard this story, but you can buy gold and silver and print it on paper with cash money, 
And they were taking that and burning it so that that dead person could use that in the afterlife. I was like, seriously, family, give me the money. I'll make sure they get it. I mean, what's the point? You know, it's those stories of being buried in a Corvette, burning money like that for the afterlife. They had Kentucky Fried Chicken at the visitation with incense sticks in it so that they would have food in the afterlife. I was real tempted to go up and take a chicken leg. I did not do it. I did not. But you understand, we find that humorous because we see the ridiculousness of it. And yet these are the kind of things that loom around us in our culture, in our world, about the afterlife. Jesus, when he addressed the afterlife, was very matter of fact. The Son of God, the one that created the universe, and all he says is, there's heaven and there's hell. The condition of it is me. I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father except, what? Through him. That was the condition of heaven. The glory, the good deeds, the praise was to our Father in heaven. That was the condition. Now, John 14. This is the last passage of the day. You believe that? What time is it? It's 1115. What's going on? You better get ready for the resurrection because something's happening with this short of a sermon. I already told Dale, as much sugar that's out there, I may not be here next Sunday. I always felt like this church is trying to kill me. You don't have a problem with sugar. Anyways, John 14, 1 through 4. Listen to what it says. Most of you probably have heard this at funeral services, but it applies to you at any age and stage of life. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Stop. Think about the reference. How many of you feel troubled? How many of you are worried and fretting over something? Dealing with problems? Well, this passage is just when you're at your at death's door, right? No, it, it's right now. That's why I said the church is a house of peace. It's a house of prayer. That's why when I look out here sometimes and I see y'all sleepy, I personally believe, one, we keep the, the pews real soft and there's good heat a lot of times. Well, my wife says we keep it too cold. I feel like we keep it too hot. But anyway, that's a different story. But when we gather here, Sometimes people get sleepy. My personal thought of that is, so often we are so busy in life, we have so much responsibility in this world, we got so many things going on, we're worried about so many things, we're sandwiched in between so many responsibility that when we finally stop and come into the house of God, praise His name, sing His glory, and relax, all of a sudden we get sleepy. Guess why? A lot of you can't sleep at night, you're worried, you're thinking about stuff, but you sure can sleep in church. Why? Because the answer is in Jesus Christ. The truth of what we study in the Bible is real and genuine. The facts of what the scripture spells out for us is real. And when you come into this house, you get it. And you feel it. So we get sleepy. Do not let your hearts be trust, uh, troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. What is Jesus telling us all? There's lots of room in the Father's house. And what is he doing? He's preparing a place for you and I. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the place to where I am going. And what is that phrase talking about? What's the importance of being in that house? The importance is Jesus Christ. I can tell you, I remember as a young man first gave my life to Jesus Christ, genuinely surrendered my life at the age of 17 to Jesus Christ. I used to hang out with one of my buddies that also gave his life at that time. 
And we would sit there and just look up words like heaven in the Bible. We'd look up resurrection in the Bible. Man, we were exciting fellas, okay? And we would just talk about, can you imagine what heaven's like? And we would just sit there late at night talking about, can you picture heaven and how wonderful it is? I very rarely have those kind of conversations anymore. Matter of fact, I apply very little of my attention and thought to those sorts of things today. Because now my heart starts to say, you know what, my mom and dad's there. My grandparents, people from my church family, the faithful, the ones that serve the Lord Jesus Christ are there. And that's what I want. Yeah, it'll be a great place. Better than paradise, right? But what's going to matter is who's there. My friends, I want all of us to be there. And there's one condition to that. It's Jesus Christ. That's the basis and principle of this whole talk about afterlife. That's the basis of why he says do not worry because it's the afterlife being with Jesus Christ. But the principle of it is You and I, knowing that, aren't just to sit here and stay warm and cozy and catch a nap and maybe have some pie afterwards. The idea is that you are nice, warm, and cozy here. You eat your pie, and then you go tell someone about Jesus and give the other half of the pie to someone who needs them, right? Don't eat the whole thing. Right, Mandy? I won't. At least in one sitting. Bottom line, last statement, Jesus said, I am what? I am the resurrection and the life. If Jesus Christ be lifted up, all men will be drawn to him. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we give you the glory, the honor, the praise. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Without it, we are completely lost. We have nothing. Lord, help set our minds and our hearts straight. Lord, may you find in us willing people that are meek and, and, and show mercy that we are people that will not be filled with ourselves but be filled with you, poor in spirit. Lord, we want to worship you with everything we have so that we may continue to worship you all the days of our eternal life. I pray over these men and women that you would use them in whatever way you see fit. And Holy Spirit, whatever you're saying inside the minds and hearts of each of us at this moment, I would pray that you would find us faithful and willing to listen. It's in your almighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you please stand up as the praise team leads us in a time of invitation.
just a couple of announcements for you probably the biggest one for today is right after service I believe there is a VBS meeting right all right I'm right good okay and directly after service are all the desserts out there I hear that the sign up is still going to be happening directly after service so stick around for about 10 minutes maybe 15 minutes they said noon but I think they'll probably wrap up just here they expect me to preach longer right okay <laughs> so we'll give it about 10 minutes you can go out right after service sign up for things knock somebody's off if they only have their name written down on one thing make sure to sign up for that because they'll pay the money to get it I've learned that one over the years so make sure and uh uh, bid on those things again that money is going to be used to help out a family that is uh, just going through some uh, ridiculously hard times and we want to be uh, generous to that and uh, quick thought I'm cleaning out everything I got right now I mean tools clothes and if you're like me you probably have an abundance of that stuff again why do we keep all those things you know how many hammers does one guy need Okay? If God gives us resources and we have the opportunity to show that generosity and help somebody else, use the tools He's given. That's what it is. It's a tool. 
So we want to be generous in doing that. Uh, other announcements? Anything? We have Bible study, 930, come Wednesday morning. Small group will meet a week from uh, tonight. We are hosting the um, sunrise service here at church, 630 on Resurrection Sunday. We'll have a breakfast directly after that. Anything else? Oh, soup kitchen coming up in a little over a week. Are you talking about this? And there was a drawing for one. Ron Watson. What was it? What was the drawing for? Huh? Mississippi mud cake. All right. Any other announcements? Turn it back over to y'all. We're gonna go ahead and do one more song, and then you guys will be dismissed to go ahead and go out there and bid on stuff and and finish out our day together so
worshiping with us today. You guys are dismissed.